Welcome to Part 68 of my video series on how to use Blender 2.7. In this video, we're going to be simulating the smashing of objects in Blender. Uh, in this case, we're going to be actually dropping the letter G, a 3D mesh, uh, onto a floor, and it's going to break into hundreds of pieces, uh, and that will be all simulated, so it'll be quite easy to create. Uh, if you liked my Facebook page at facebook.com slash borncg, you would have seen this video actually go up uh, yesterday afternoon before this tutorial was published to YouTube. Um, but let's go ahead and check out the video now and I'll kind of play it through a few times so you can see exactly what's going on. I'll press play. And as you can see, the G uh, stands up at the, or floats in the uh, air for a few moments um, and then falls and breaks into a bunch of pieces which all sort of uh, tumble on the ground and it looks quite realistic. We'll play it one more time. You might notice that there is some motion blur here so I will be adding that into this video as well just to make it a bit more realistic. Let's go ahead and jump in now. Um, in order to create this effect, we have to actually enable an add-on in Blender called the Cell Fracture Add-on. So I'll uh, click on my splash screen to get rid of it and then under file user preferences the fourth tab on the top which is add-ons um, you'll need to go into here and search for cell c-e-l-l -L, and then you'll need to enable by clicking i already have it enabled by by checking this checkbox and then click on save user settings to enable and save um, this cell fracture add-on uh, to always be enabled so i'm going to click on the x to close my user preferences and now i have this cell fracture button um, under the Tools tab in my tool shelf. I'll actually enable my screencast key so you can see what I'm uh, pressing and what mouse clicks I do down here in my 3D viewport. So if you press T, you can bring up your tool shelf and then you can get this button. We're not gonna just uh, break apart a cube because that's boring. And I wanna show you a few of the issues you might have breaking apart a mesh uh, that you created. Uh, so let's go ahead and delete this cube. I'll click on X and press delete uh, to get rid of that. I'm gonna add a letter, so I'm gonna press shift A, I'm gonna add a piece of text, and I'll press tab to go into this text uh, edit mode, I'll press backspace a few times, and I'm gonna add the letter G just because it has a nice uh, shape to it. Um, and so I'm gonna actually select a font here, I'll go to my fonts tab in the properties window with it selected, and I'm going to click on the folder next to regular font. And on a Windows computer, your fonts folder, all your fonts are in the Windows folder, uh, in the fonts folder. If you're on a Mac, you have a, uh, a library folder right on your Mac hard drive, and then um, there's a fonts folder inside that library folder. Um, you can preview how fonts look. Thank you for those of you who pointed that out in one of my previous videos. Um, you can click on this button up here, and that will show you a thumbnail, even of fonts. I'm gonna select just the first font. That's kind of nice and bold. Great. Uh, it has a bit of a serif. It has kind of uh, a bit of fanciness to it, which is kind of nice. Um, I'm going to make it a bit more bold, not too much, uh, with this offset value. And I'm going to make it 3D with extrude. And this text object is not a mesh until I press Alt-C. With it selected, Alt-C will bring up my Convert To menu. And I'm going to select Mesh from Curve Meta Surf Text. And so now if I press tab, it goes into the meshes edit mode and it's a very ugly mesh. Uh, to solve this, I'll press tab. I'm actually gonna use the remesh modifier um, and I believe I have a video on that modifier in this tutorial series. So I'll put that up on the screen uh, right now. Um, with my G selected, I'll go to my wrench tab and what the remesh modifier does, it's right there, is it basically recalculates out your mesh. So if I press a Z now to go into wireframe mode, you can see that instead of having all like triangular faces, um, it makes it basically uh, by default out of um, squares or rectangular polygons, which is nice. It's way too simple though, it kind of simplifies it out. Um, so I'm gonna turn this octree depth up to six. And then I'm going to turn my scale down to make it uh, have bigger polygons, uh, but still keep the right shape roughly. You might notice that it kind of does funny things as you're scaling around, so just find what works for you. If you're doing a word that has more than one letter, you'll want to uncheck remove disconnected pieces so you can actually see. And this will work on many pieces in the same um, mesh. Okay, so that's looking pretty good to me. Maybe a bit more than that. Um, be like that. That's looking pretty good to me. I'll press apply because we have to have just the mesh with no modifiers on it for this to work. 
Um, I want to separate what I want to break apart and what I want to have simulated falling into its own layer. So layers are down here, of course. If you have a mesh selected or any object selected, you can press M on your keyboard to bring up the move to layer window. I'm going to move this selected object over to the next layer. So I've got my lamp and my uh, camera in the first layer and then my falling original object in the next layer. I'm going to scale it up a little bit. I'll tap S and then I'll rotate it to face forward. So I'll tap R and then X and 90 and enter to rotate it 90 degrees on the X axis. And you'll notice this origin is sort of not in the middle of it. I can fix that in object mode by going to set origin and then origin to center of mass. And let's go ahead and put it sort of uh, centered in my scene. I'll go to my front orthographic view uh, with one and then five on my number pad on my keyboard. I'm going to move the G up to right about there because it's going to start floating in midair. And I think we're almost ready to use the cell fracture add-on. Uh, before I do that though, I'm going to add a ground into my world. So I'll press shift A on my keyboard. I'm going to add a mesh um, you might be tempted to add a plane, but I'm going to add a, a cylinder actually uh, because I don't want this to have just a, a paper thin ground because pieces will actually uh, fall through the ground uh, because simulations are not that accurate in Blender. So I'm going to press S and then Z to scale this down on the Z axis and then S and then Shift Z to scale it on the X and Y. So if you press S and then Shift Z, it will negate scaling on the Z axis. Um, I like that. I'm going to actually move this ground to its own layer though. So with it selected, I'll press M and I'm going to put it down, let's say right there, sure, just so we know that our main objects are on the top sort of layer and then, um, or top row of layers, and then our ground is just down there. I'm going to now select the G and I'm going to use the cell fracture add-on. And of course you find that over here in the tool shelf under the tools tab under the edit heading. I'm going to click on cell fracture with my G selected. And this is one of the few times in Blender and Blender does not actually like this, or at least the people who make Blender don't actually like this. When Blender comes up with um, pop-up windows, you don't see it very often, but this is an add-on. There are a few settings here that I always change. The first one is always the source limit. This is, I think, how many shards it breaks up your object into. I'm going to change that to 500. Um, I'm going to have it use its own vertices as reference and not particles because we're not using particles. Um, I'm going to change the recursion value, and that means how many um, pieces it breaks each piece up into. So basically, it'll um, break up your mesh into these 500 or so pieces, and then it'll try breaking apart each one of those chunks into its own smaller piece. And we can actually make it do that um, as many times as we want by turning up this number. I'm going to use two, and it won't do it every single time. It'll leave some chunks um, their original size depending on this value here. This is the likelihood of recursion. So at the, a two point or 0 0.25, it will um, only do approximately uh, a quarter of the chunks, um, which is great. Um, do I want to change anything else? No, so let's go ahead and click OK, and it'll actually start working now. If you can uh, manage to actually look at your object uh, with this off to the side, um, that's great. So you can kind of see what's happening now. It's actually making a bunch of chunks in a rectangular prism or a cube around your object, and then it's cutting away the extra bits from that cube using basically the Boolean modifier. Uh, if you know what that is. Um, where it put all the shards, because after it's finished, you'll just see your original G again, is it put all the, the chunks or, or shards over in the next layer, which is really nice. Um, so now you can see what our result is. And there are some pretty uh, kind of big issues here. And I want to talk about this, and this is why I'm using a letter uh, that started with a funny mesh, because if you have any gaps or any funny geometry, um, because the Boolean modifier is quite buggy anyways, um, you might find that you run into some of these issues. So I'm actually going to delete this. I'll press A a few times because it's on its own layer, um, and I'll press X and delete the simulation. Uh, what's happening here is that if I press tab to go into my original mesh, I have some funny faces here, at least the vertices are funny. Um, this face here is one of the areas where it had problems, 
And that's because you can see that we have this vertice that I have selected, and it's sort of intruding on this triangle. So if, you, if I move it up, you can kind of see that there's this kind of weird, um, impossible geometry that's happening here. Um, and the way I can sort of fix this is by selecting these two vertices and pressing J, so that now it knows kind of that that um, point right there is inside of the original larger triangle by making a couple of smaller triangles. Do I have that problem anywhere else? Um, be right there. Um, I think that's okay though, but maybe I'll just select those two anyways and press J. Um, I know that was one of the problem areas. Um, that should be okay because it's a rectangle. Um, you might run into some problems um, where you have overlapping pieces. Um, so maybe right there, or actually on the back I can see one. Uh, yeah, so there's some funny geometry here. You have to be quite picky about your, your meshes uh, when you're using the cell fracture add-on. Um, if I move um, that up, you can see that's how it sort of wants to be, but as soon as you go into the original triangle there, uh, it doesn't know what to do. So I'm gonna right click to put it back where it was, and then maybe I'll select these two vertices and press J. Um, that's looking better, although now we have some issues where that one goes up into that triangle. So maybe I'll just move that one straight down to kind of resolve that. Um, are there any other big problem areas? Well, the best way to actually find out is by trying the cell fracture add-on again. So I'll press tab to go back into uh, object mode and I deleted all the shards from the next layer. And so now I'll go back to cell fracture. I'm not gonna change anything here. Um, actually, I actually forgot to change noise. So if you add some noise between zero and one, it'll sort of make your shards maybe more random or maybe different than they were before. So I'll click on OK. Okay, let's see how that did. I actually sped that part of the video up, obviously, just kind of for the sake of this video. So let's go ahead over to the shards layer and let's take a look. It's looking pretty good at the front. Ooh, we've got some issues um, at the back, definitely. Um, and each time you do this, it will get a different result, even if you leave the settings exactly the same. So down at the back of the bottom of the G, there are some issues. Let's leave this um, and look at the original mesh. So this is the front and back. Great, I'll press tab with it selected. Um, we have some issues right around here, uh, possibly because of this little section, so I'll just um, press G twice, and that will let me slide this vertice um, around, kind of like that. Or I can actually press uh, 1 to go to my front view, and I believe Control 1 will go to my back view. So now I'm looking at this straight on, and now I can move this around without worrying about pushing it forward or backward. Um, to make it more even. I think I might have some issues right here. Yes, I do. Uh, let's move that one around. In fact, I'll just move this one up a little bit. You really have to be picky for this not to get errors. Um, where else did I have any issues in the back of the G? I think we've solved that sort of area there for the most part. Uh, there's probably some issues with that curve, so I'll go back there and very quickly. Uh, let's see if we have any of those issues. Yes, we probably do. Um, I'm going to select these two vertices and I'll press J. Let's select these two and J. And um, do we have any issues around here? Well, I don't like the topology of this very much, uh, but that's just, just sort of what we're left with. Um, let's go and see how that does. I'll delete the, those shards. I'll press A in this layer, X to delete. And I'm going to speed up this part of the video. Let's go ahead and use cell fracture. Okay, let's go ahead and check out our result. Whatever it is, I'll keep it. Um, yeah, it's looking pretty good to me. As you can see, there are some very big uh, chunks, and then if it, uh, it actually did recursion twice, um, we get some smaller chunks, which is nice. The next thing I want to do is I want to simulate um, both the original G and all the shards falling down, which means we have to use uh, Blender's built-in bullet physics engine. Uh, and so to do that, I'm actually gonna go and select uh, the floor layer, and I'll select the ground, which was just a cylinder, of course. I'm gonna go over to my tool shelf and the physics tab and click on add passive, and that will make this ground a passive object, which will not actually fall with gravity, but it will collide with other objects, so the ground is not gonna move, so it's passive. I'm gonna to go to my um, shards layer, and I'm gonna press uh, A a few times to select um, all of the shards, and if you have add active over here disabled or it's grayed out, um, what you can do, and this sometimes happens, especially if you have your lamp in your scene as well and you've accidentally selected your lamp, is if you hold shift and right click on one of the shards, 
um, it will make that object the most recently selected object, in other words, the active object, and then you'll be able to click on Add Active, and it will actually add physics to all of the shards at once, which is nice. If I simulate now, I'll actually select both the ground and the shards layer, and I'll press Alt-A to play. It will simulate fairly realistically. Um, but to make it more realistic, I'm actually going to change a few of the physics properties over here. So still only with, um, actually I'll just go back to the shards layer and press A and A a few times. Um, and if you have to hold shift and right click and select one of the shards just to make it the active uh, piece. Over here in the physics tab now, um, because we have the shard selected, or at least one shard is the active um, selected object, um, I'm going to enable collision margin. And by default, um, it's 0 0.04, which might mean if you simulate now, things will start to crumble right away. And actually, that actually should only matter with one or so objects. Um, but I'm going to change this down to 0 0.001. That's very, very small of a margin. But actually, I've only enabled collision margin and this number on the one object that I selected last. To make these settings propagate out to all the selected objects, I have to actually click on um, copy from active. In other words, the last object that was selected, so copy from active. So now if I select any of the shards, you'll see it has those values. Um, if I hadn't done copy from active, that would not be the case, I believe. So now I can simulate, I'll press Alt A, it'll fall down. Even though the other layer is not visible, it'll still simulate with anything else that is part of the physics world. Um, in this case, the uh, passive ground. I'm not going to simulate the entire or the whole uh, G in my other layer, uh, which is not yet part of the physics uh, passive or active world, because as you saw just a moment ago, um, objects in other layers can interfere with each other, and if I had the G and the pieces of the G um, both simulating, they would kind of mess each other up. So my shards, if I go back to that layer, are falling quite nicely. Um, it looks like some of the pieces are actually going through the ground. So what I might do is I might actually show the ground and make sure it has, um, with it selected, I want to have a margin. Um, I'm going to use just a, a cylinder shape of uh, rigid body collision and then I'll label collision margins and I'll type in actually I'll leave that the way it is let's go ahead and re-simulate and you probably will see your simulation cache down here anytime you change anything in your scene that's got to do with your simulation you'll see this down here most likely um, let's go ahead and re-simulate alt a and it's still falling through um, but I'm not going to worry about that for the sake of this video I might just make the ground a bit more um, thick but actually, I don't like the way that cylinder is doing this, so I'm going to use a, a convex hull instead. And let's go ahead and re-simulate. Yeah, that seemed to work a bit better. Um, when you use cylinder, it's a low-resolution cylinder, so it actually didn't fit the right shape. I'm letting it simulate all the way through because I want to take all those shards now. I'll press A to deselect everything. I'll use B for box select and select the G. I want to bake the simulation to keyframe so that this simulation doesn't interfere with the simulation of my entire G. So I'm going to select those and then I'll click on bake to keyframes and I'm going to bake, uh, yeah, every frame step so I'm not going to change anything there. And it'll take a second, but in a moment, it will actually have a bunch of keyframes on every single one of those shards. Now, I found that that's actually pretty smart. If I make uh, a dope sheet window on my screen, so I'm gonna make this window a bit taller, I'll drag the corner of this down to divide the window into two, and I'll change this top uh, timeline into a dope sheet window. There actually are some gaps. It's pretty smart, um, sometimes anyways, when it knows that an object is not moving, it does not put keyframes there, which is nice instead of having all the keyframes for every single object. Great, so these shards are no longer part of the physics simulation. It's just like it's animated, that's what I want. Um, I'm gonna simulate now my falling entire G, so I'll select that one, add active. Um, and I'll press Alt A. And as you can see, it hits the ground and this uh, G, because it has that 
flat bottom piece, it just sort of hits the ground, which actually doesn't matter because I'm not going to include this part of the simulation. I'm actually going to swap between the entire, this whole G with the shards as soon as it first hits that ground. So I'm not concerned about this. Let's go ahead and re-simulate this all the way to the end. I'll press Alt-A again. It'll simulate out all the way to the end of my timeline. I'll just go ahead and speed this part up. Okay, so we have the entire simulation. I'll press escape and just like with the shards, I'm going to click on a bake to keyframes right there and I'll click OK. So now I want to see where and what, what frame the G hits the ground. And if you have any issues um, where maybe the shards, because of their different mass and because of the inaccuracy of Blender's physics simulation, um, if they hit the ground at different times, um, which it might happen in this case, we'll have to adjust our simulation. Um, in this case, it hits at frame 24 or so. Yeah, so at frame 24, that's going to be the last time we see this G. Uh, and I'll show you how to swap between your shards and your, and your uh, entire G uh, in just a moment. Let's go ahead and see the other one. I'll hold shift and select both of these. And yeah, it's looking pretty good. They stay together fairly well. Um, you might need to re-simulate with a different mass if you find that your two different objects are falling at different times um, or they're slightly different, like one falls faster than the other. Um, you can always move around your keyframes um, in, if you have any issues like that. But let's go ahead now and swap between the two meshes. Basically, I want to show um, the entire G up until and including frame 24 and hide all the shards um, until frame 24 and then on frame 25 you'll see the shards and you won't see the entire G again. And the way you do this is I'm going to select all the layers with objects on them and I have to change now my render engine to uh, cycles render. Uh, this is very important because under the render layers tab you have this section called exclude. If you haven't used render layers before, uh, they're very, very powerful. You can um, render only certain layers in your scene or only certain aspects like shadows or reflections or um, really it's very, very um, powerful. You can get quite deep into this using uh, compositing nodes, but we won't go there. What I want to do here is use this exclude section, which is only available if you use cycles, um, to exclude certain um, layers um, from the render, but we can actually animate this. So what I want to do is I want to show the entire G up until frame 24. And so what I'll do is I'm going to exclude the third layer, which is the shards layer, um, at frame 24. And I can animate this. So I'll put my mouse over here and I'll press I on my keyboard that will insert a keyframe. And then on the very next frame, I'll use my arrow keys on my keyboard to go over to frame 25. I'm going to exclude the other layer and then I'll press I again. So again, on frame 24 in my simulation, I've excluded the shards layer, and I'll, on the next layer, I have another keyframe, uh, because it's yellow, of excluding the original G layer, and you'll still see everything in your window, assuming you have all your layers selected, and you will need to, but now, if I go to my frame 24 and do a quick test render, I'm not even sure where my camera is in my scene, let's go uh, through my camera, um, in this window. Uh, my camera is not in a very good spot, so let's go ahead and lock my camera to view and kind of orbit that around. Uh, zoom out, maybe they'll make our light into a sunlight, maybe I'll rotate on the z-axis my lamp around. Let's go and see how that will look. If I press uh, render under the camera tab, uh, we have our G just sitting above the ground. Um, even though my shards layer was selected before I pressed render, um, it's not showing the shards, and that's great on frame 24. On frame 25, I'll use my arrow keys to go to frame 25. If I click render again, crossing my fingers, uh, we will see now only the shards layer, which is already starting to break into the ground, and we do not see the entire G again. So now we have our crumbling G, and if I go to frame, let's say, 28 and press render, uh, for real, you cannot see the original entire G uh, again, which is great. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, uh, Colin has made a big mistake here. Um, he didn't put a material on his original G um, at the beginning, and so now I have all of these shards, and I have to add materials to all of them individually. Well, 
you would be wrong because there is a really great keyboard shortcut and I left this until the end uh, so I could actually just show you this. Um, if I select all of the shards uh, with the A key with only that layer visible, I can go over to my materials tab. Of course, I'm using the cycles render engine here. I'll click on new to add a material, which is only adding it right now to the active or last selected object. I'm going to make a material. Let's go ahead and make it orange and I'll open up a, another window and I'll make it a um, node editor window and I'm gonna make a bit better of material here so I'll press shift A I'm gonna add a mix shader node right uh, where is it right there I'll put it right there I'm gonna add another shader it's gonna be a glossy shader you probably know where I'm going here I'll press shift A I'm gonna add an input Fresnel node just to make it very realistic and we're gonna leave, whoops, we're gonna leave um, our index of refraction to 1.45, which is basically plastic. It looked kind of like plastic. Now this is where the magic comes in. I only have um, one shard where this is applied to. If I change this to render, you'll be able to see that. But if my mouse in this window, I press Control L on my keyboard, it'll bring up this make links um, menu, Control L again. And then I can actually copy all of the materials, all of the modifiers, the fonts, really there's lots of op options here. Um, but in this case, we're gonna use materials. It's gonna copy the material from the active object to all the other selected objects. And as you can see now, we have that nice orange uh, material that I made on all of the objects. Let's go ahead and add that material to the original G as well. I'll select it. It's hard to see, but I have right clicked on it. I'm gonna add that just like that. And let's make sure I'll actually go out of my uh, render view so I can select my uh, ground and I can actually remove the physics from it. So you can see it had a green outline and I'm just gonna make this have a diffuse white uh, material there. I'm gonna make the background of my world also white. So hopefully it'll look quite nice um, through my viewport. I'm gonna select all the layers again. And even though you can see the gene right now, if I render this out, it looks pretty good. I have a white ground and a white background, which all kind of nicely blend together. And I'll press escape. Now to add that motion blur in, that's very easy in cycles. Um, I'll just go to my camera tab and then check motion blur right there. So now when your um, G or whatever you have falling is falling, um, it'll actually look at the frames before and after. And of course you can adjust the shutter speed uh, of your camera. I'm not really sure how that um, relates with your uh, actual camera in your scene. Uh, and now if I render out though, it will be a little blip blurred, which will add a lot of uh, realism to your render. Um, yeah, I think that will be it. The last thing you might wanna do, which I did in my uh, example video of the same G or similar G falling, is under sampling, I clicked uh, next to C, this little clock button. What this does is when you're rendering with Blender cycles, there is some graininess um, in every frame of rendering that you have, especially in dark areas of your render, so there isn't much graininess here. But what this little clock button will do is it'll render each frame with a different seed, which will make the greenness sort of just animated uh, which look more realistic, especially if you want it to look like it's moving or it's a video. Uh, if you don't have that, the greenness will appear the exact same or all the dots will appear in exactly the same spot, uh, which will not look very realistic. So I'll leave that checked. So if I animated that out, it would look quite realistic. Uh, let's go ahead and do one last test to render. I'll go back up and click on render. Oh, actually, I'll press escape on my keyboard. That's one thing I forgot to mention. I'll press escape again. If you want your uh, letter uh, to stay at the top of the screen and float for a few moments instead of falling right away, well, that's actually quite easy um, because this is all just a keyframed animation now. If I select uh, maybe all the shards, in fact, I'm gonna just have these two layers visible because of the only animated things in my scene, the shards and the original G. Um, if I select all of these objects and then down here, I'll select all of my keyframes, I can just press G to slide this around so I can start my entire simulation be at frame 20 or so. So now everything will hang out at the top or float and then it'll fall 
and then it will work. Of course, if you do that and you've already animated your render layers, um, you actually animated where it was excluding, or what keyframe was excluding different layers on, then you will need to redo this. I believe you can right click uh, in this area and clear keyframes. Um, so now I have to change where that is. Um, so maybe frame 44 will be the last time you see um, the G. So I'm gonna select all these layers again and I'm going to um, exclude, um, I believe I'm including the third layer um, at this frame. So I'll tap I on my keyboard. Um, I'll go to the very next frame and I'm gonna exclude the solid G layer. I'll tap I again. So now if I go back one frame to frame 44 and I do a quick render, um, you should only see the whole G. And if I press escape a few times and go to frame 45, you should now only see when I render out the crumble G. Uh, but that will be it for this video. Uh, please don't forget to like this video. If you learned something, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. If you want to see more videos like this one in Blender and in tech, please don't forget to check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash borncg. But that'll be it for this one. Thanks. Bye-bye.